It's been about two and a half years since I was last here at Cress, and a lot has changed. So the first thing that's changed is last time I was here, there was a microphone. Can you all hear me in the back? Okay, this is good volume. I think I can sustain this through the evening. I will take questions, although I may ask you to delay a question or I may cut you off to make sure we also keep moving along. Uh, the talk, the, the room closes at 8.45. I don't think I'll go that long unless we get lots of questions, but I'll be, make sure I finish well before that point in time. So you'll notice that the title has changed some. Life is full of changes, as is renewables full of changes very actively. Airlines disappeared. The reason is because when I was trying it out on people, trying to talk out on people, the airline paradigm didn't work. So apologies, if you want to know what it is, I can tell you at the very end. Without further ado, I have a bunch of hobbies, like everybody. One of them is gardening and cooking and eating. And, um, I have some questions for you because I need to know something about my audience. How many of you are really good with numbers and graphs? So this is a very numerate audience, okay? You all know an awful lot more. Most audiences that I get into, I'll have 10 to 20 percent saying they're numerate. So I will pitch this somewhere between the people that aren't really comfortable with numbers and graphs and the people that are. I'm trying to keep this so that it's a balance. I've got to keep the people that are numbers and graphs happy, happy, but I also want to keep the other people happy too. So this isn't going to satisfy everybody perfectly, and every now and again, if you're not a numerate person, you're not one of the people that raised your hands, then just take a short break. I promise we'll be back on track pretty quickly. Just the same, there's a lot of graphical information in this talk. I'm going to explain it. It'll all, I hope, make sense. And Every talk I do is different. This talk is about 20% new. That means not all of it's going to work, and I would love it if you all would come up and, and talk to me at the end and tell me this worked or, boy, that didn't work and, and why it did or didn't. That would help me improve this. This talk, by the way, recently I had the pleasure of giving this talk in an ex parte conversation. This is a, a very formal process with all three public utilities commissioners. And so they actually, uh, I think they loved it, which was great. And hopefully you will too. So how many people, show of hands, if the goal is 100% renewables by 2030, how many of you would be satisfied with 95%? No, yeah, everybody, okay. Um, we have politicians that are saying, oh gosh, you can't do 100%, it's impossible. And I think that's just a big talking point and it's not really meaningful. I think most people understand we're talking about 95, 98 percent. Oh yeah, if we can do 100 percent, we will, but that's not where we need to be in 2030 or something like that. Uh, and are, just a show of hands, are there any elected representatives in the audience right now? Well, I, I don't see any, but I do want to say that this was one heck of a session at the Colorado Legislature. The number of bills that were passed here is absolutely phenomenal. Many of the bills are of outstanding quality. Much of the reason that these bills are as good as they are is from certain individuals in the room. Uh, Vince, for example, um, the other people that are involved with the Crest Policy Committee. Larry Milosevic's comments on policy for uh, Energy Freedom Colorado. Let's give these people a round of applause. And how many people have grown zucchinis? Okay, you know what the problem is. Um, I got a joke for you. Why do people lock their cars on summer nights in Paonia? Just so you know, if you're not familiar with Colorado, Paonia is a garden spot. Okay, how many, any, any, any ideas? Well, if you don't, <laughs> you end up with your car full of zucchini. The problem with zucchinis is that you have too much some of the time. Now, I know that the people that have grown zucchinis have had this problem, and the question is, what do you do with the surplus? And it's a real specific problem because you only have them for a few days a year. And in fact, if I was to graph the entire year as a chart where hour zero, this is every single hour of the year, is here, is over here, and the last hour of the year is over there, 
Well, the little green zucchini colored bumps, that's my surplus zucchinis. That's hard to do something with, and that's why people resort to leaving them on doorsteps. Um, uh, just as a curiosity, how many people that used to grow zucchinis don't grow them anymore? Yeah. Okay. My daughter does not bake zucchini cakes, but so far, but she does bake some really awesome cakes, and like most bakers, she follows a recipe. This is the recipe for a future that we can really support for Colorado for low cost, high renewable energy. One part making electricity 100%, right, 95 or 98%, and one part of electrifying everything else. I want to look at the dollars that are involved. Oh yeah, I want to look at the greenhouse gases also, but I want to look at the dollars. So let's just start at the top with electricity. And I'm told I want to use my mouse here so that you can actually see where I am and also so that the people on the video will see where I am. So electricity is, accounts for about 40% of our greenhouse gases. That was in 2016. And all of us together, our entire electric bill is about five and a half billion dollars for Colorado. All told, that's billion with a B, big number. Oil, which is mostly goes to gasoline and diesel, is 35% of our CO2, and that works out to six and a half billion dollars per year. And natural gas, and this is the natural gas that is not used to make electricity, but is used to warm our houses, to warm our hot water, to uh, make things that use natural gas to making things, works out to about one and a half billion dollars. All told, our energy bill in Colorado is 13 and a half billion dollars. That's a big bill. So what would happen to the electricity use if we were to electrify each of these? And what would happen to the cost of, the elect of, the, of that thing if we were buying electricity instead of oil, instead of gasoline? Well, the answer is it would increase our electricity use by about 40%. Is that a perfect number? Oh, no. It's just an estimate. And it would cost us about $2.3 billion. That's as if we were paying for electricity at the same cost that we're paying for it today. And then natural gas would use another 20%, more than we're currently using. And it would cost us about $1.2 billion for the electricity. So all told, here's our bottom line. We'd go from $13.5 billion to $9 billion. That's a savings of $4.5 billion per year. Four and a half billion dollar savings per year. There isn't anything that we can do that's an economic stimulus that's bigger than that. That's a lot like putting $900 a year into every single adult in Colorado's pocket. That's a lot of money. There are other losers and winners in this. The electric utilities are going to win. They see 60% more electricity being used. And the oil and gas industry, they're the big losers. This is why we see the political pushback that we're seeing is that they stand to lose six and a half billion dollars. That's a lot of money. That's why there's the pushback from the oil and gas industry. So there's a problem in this. If I'm paying my electric bill and it suddenly went up 60%, I'm probably going to be pissed. Even if my gasoline bill has gone down, that's kind of a mental shift for people. And this is something that we can start working on today to work through this with people so that we can actually market to them that this is in fact a savings, but it's not all coming out of one pot, okay? You're not writing one check for all of your energy, you're writing three checks, or probably you're buying gasoline with your credit card and it disappears into your credit card payments. Um, your natural gas might be on one bill, your electric, or they might be combined. 
it's hard to tell. But if we increase electric bills, we need to be prepared to do that. This is an essential question that we can start answering today, that we can start working on. And in fact, this is something that volunteers can help with. Hint, hint. Uh, another hobby that I have is modeling electric grids and renewables, seriously. Nobody really pays me to do this. Um, it's lots of fun. Uh, I enjoy it at least. I'm definitely a geek. Um, so just for the non-numerate people, the people that are nervous about charts, just a little warning. There's a complex chart ahead. Don't worry, we won't spend very long on it. This is what the model looks like. It's written in Microsoft Excel. You fill in blanks and it changes different things. It lets you look at every single hour of the year. It's based on actual data. It allows you to do two scenarios. Those are the two scenarios here. There are two things you need to know about models that isn't anything to do with the charts, and that's that models do not tell you the future. Nothing tells us the future. What it does do is it tells us possible futures based on certain assumptions. Possible futures. Okay, that's enough of that. That was too complicated. And what I wanted to do was to simplify this idea. All this data, this is too hard for most people to look at, even if they're numerate, particularly when it's about this big on your screen, up on the screen here. So I simplified it. This is a simplification. If we were running at, come on, hello. <laughs> oh, I've lost my cursor. Sorry, people on screen. I'll point right here, then you know what's going on. <laughs> 50% renewables, perfect 50%. That's that middle bar there. That's what it would look like in this kind of chart. This is every hour of the year graphed, but it might not be in order. Every hour is graphed, and perfect 100% is down here. This is just to tell us where we are and to help us see visually what's going on. Because some people, you can say 50%, but other people and will understand it, and other people need to see it. So this is allows the people that need to see to have that. Where did the data come from? Well, it came from several places. Excel Energy provided us with data. Platte River Power Authority. This is an electric generating and transmitting company that services four cities in northern Colorado, Longmont, Loveland, Estes Park, and Fort Collins. Okay? They are there to serve their four cities, period. That's it. They're nonprofit and from the Energy Information Agency. That's where most of this data came, Department of Energy. Well, we wanted to compare Platte River Power Authority, PRPA up at the top there, with Excel, just to see what would happen in comparison across. They both announced in December, within a week of each other, just a coincidence, 100% non-carbon goals. And in fact, the fourth column there is when they're gonna hit 100%. Platte River Power Authority, PRPA, 100% by 2030, Excel 100% by 2050. Platte River Power Authority is a lot more aggressive than Excel. The third column, 50% renewable energy, Platte River Power Authority will get there next year, the end of next year, they'll arrive at 50%. Excel 2023, this is a giant change for both of them since both of them were mostly fossil fueled just a few years ago. You can see how big they are. That's the percent of Colorado served. 6% Platte River Power Authority, not insignificant. 54% um, for Excel. They're the biggest generation and transmission company in Colorado. And finally, the blended rate. If you took all of the electricity they sold and divided that into all of the money that they collected, that's the blended rate. It's the best way we have to compare electricity rates between two companies. Eight cents for Platte River Power Authority, that's for their end use customers, not for the cities, for the people that are writing checks like you and me, versus nine and a half cents for Excel. Platte River Power Authority has the lowest electricity rates in the state. They also probably have the best reliability in the state, probably hands down. The lights don't go off very much in Platte River Power Authority territory. Well, that's a pretty funny thing. Huh. Excel tells us how great they are all the time. In fact, if Excel were to charge, just like Platte River Power Authority charged, it would be a far 
hundred, four hundred million dollars a year savings. That's the, what the difference is between eight cents and nine and a half cents a kilowatt hour as the blended rate. Four hundred million dollars. It kind of says that maybe bigger is not better. What about the rest of the generation companies in the state? Well, Tri-State, we don't, they don't, none of these others have long-term goals for renewables, um, but they have different amounts and different costs. Excel is far and away not the most expensive. There are other utilities that are more expensive in the state. Uh, I, th I just find this to be fairly interesting uh, on this. I'm seeing some heads nodding. So let's get real specific. It's hard to talk about all of reliable, cheap, and 100% in one slide. So we're just going to focus for the moment on keeping the lights on. That's what reliability means. And 100% for the next couple of slides. So you remember this one. This is our simplified view. Every hour of the year is shown. This is solar by itself, 30% renewables. And you can see the green is renewables, and the kind of brownish color is fossil, brownish red. Wind by itself. I'm not telling you how much solar or wind it is. This is just what we did with our modeling run. I'll explain a little more in a minute. But this is what 60% looks like. If we put the two together, we get 75%. Solar, wind, and hydro gets us to 85%. Excel does not have much hydro, but Platte River Power Authority does. And then if we add in storage, we get to 95% renewables. That last little bit that I've circled here on the slide, that last little bit, that's the part that's still fossil. If we could resolve that with renewables, then we'd be 100% perfect renewables for every single hour of the year. That'd be pretty cool. But this is what 95% looks like. Can we keep the lights on for Platte River Power Authority? I should add. This modeling, this is based on Platte River Power Authority's actual load data, solar and wind for 2017, and hydro, their actual generation data every single hour of the year is mapped. Can we keep the lights on with fossils for Platte River Power Authority? Well, like most electric utilities, Platte River, uh, Platte River Power Authority has some amount of coal, quite a bit of coal-fired generation, and some amount of natural gas, and they also have contracts for hydro, solar, and wind. Well, coal-fired power plants don't work well with renewables. That's because a coal-fired power plant is meant to run like this all the time, and when you're trying to get the rest of what needs to be done for renewables, when renewables are doing this all the time, it's very hard for something that goes like this to fill in the blanks. So that doesn't work very well. If you have any questions about that, ask me at the end. I'll explain more. Natural gas turbines, however, are meant to go like this. So they work very well with something that's going like this. Platte River Power Authority has five gas turbines. Almost all electric utilities have some amount of gas turbines. Those five gas turbines are almost certainly enough to fill in the blanks so that we can keep the lights on without the coal-fired power plants at that 95% level and the levels in between. So we can probably do that. That's reliability. We did it. We kept the lights on. Oh, oh, okay. The electric utility, Platte River Power Authority, has an aggressive 2030 goal. They're modeling this themselves. This isn't over until they say that the lights will stay on. They have to be convinced. They're the people that keep our lights on. That's a serious issue. Uh, I periodically hear people talking about, yeah, well, we, can, we could survive if we didn't ha have the lights on all the time. We would not survive. It would not, that would be the end of moving forward to high levels of renewables. Got to keep the lights on. So I'm going to do a couple slides that kind of span this gap between reliable and cheap. So we're going to talk about all three for a little bit, and then we'll just talk about being inexpensive, being cheap. So you remember this graph here. We've already seen this a bunch of times. I'm just going to take the last three, and we're going to talk a little bit more. I'm going to tell more of the truth, because when you take and simplify a chart, oftentimes you lose some of the data that's actually behind that. So in fact, when I have just solar, wind, and hydro at these levels, 
This might not be the optimum level, but this level. I have 45% surplus. I have excess zucchinis. I have a lot of excess zucchinis. That's a real problem. It's not a problem for reliability, though, because I can turn the solar panels off if there's too much, or turn some of them off. I can turn the wind turbines off. Uh, that's reliability, but I probably don't want to do that to keep the price low. Let's focus in on just the 95% piece. So 35% surplus, this is what the data really looks like. How many people know what a load duration chart is? We've got about 5% of the audience. That's pretty typical. I'm not going to explain it. Um, you will recognize this. This is a modified load duration chart. What you care about is what's above 100%, because when we've met load, that's 100%, the lights stay on. And anything that's surplus, actually, we have to do something with it like turn it off. This actually explains it. The purple line, that's 100%. We've met load at 100%. All loads are met. Below, that's talking about reliability. If you have a blank there that you can't fill in, then you've got, um, you've, you've got a real problem. The lights go out. When we're above, that's cost. That's just surplus. It's only about cost. Most of this talk is about cost, not reliability. What's interesting, there's some interesting things about this, and I really wish that my pointer was going here. So excuse me, audience, I'm going to disappear. When we added storage, that's why this line is flat. That's very odd. There's a lot of this time where we're right at 100%. That's the impact of storage. Because when we don't have quite enough and we have juice in the, maybe it's batteries or maybe it's pumped hydro, I don't care, probably going to be batteries. Mass production works, okay? Um, it fills in. And when there's a little bit of excess, it takes and charges the batteries without excess. That's exactly what we'd like it to do. That's what the impact of storage. And interestingly, we have surplus for more than half of the year but it might not be the first half of the year. It's going to be hours all over the place. We'll look at that in more detail in a couple minutes. But there's another issue about reliable and cheap and 100% and storage that we noticed, and we thought this was pretty interesting. This is pretty much what we had before on the left side. We have solar, wind, and hydro at 85%, and solar, wind, hydro with a small amount of storage that's 90%. I didn't show you that before, but it's in here now with the small storage. Solid amount of storage gets us 95%. Big storage gets us 99%. And it's a hint, ginormous storage is needed to get to 100%. Here are surpluses, 45, 40, and 35%. But let's watch step by step what happens to the storage. Well, solar, wind, and hydro, there is no storage, so zero for storage. And there's no usage of the storage. The first step to get to 90%, that takes 500 megawatt hours of storage. Utility people right now think that's a lot of storage. They think that's a huge amount of storage, actually, electric utilities. But I will point out that Excel is installing quite a bit more than that in, in Colorado, and that'll be built in the 2023 time frame. And my suspicion is that very soon utilities will not look at that as a lot of storage. 500 megawatt hours. That 500 megawatt hours gets us the first 5% of moving up in renewables. We get from 85 to 90%. We get a whole 5% for just 500 megawatts of storage. That's not too bad. And that last column, you have to speak way up. Is this Platte River Power Authority system or Excel? Platte River Power Authority. Okay, so the numbers would be different if it was Excel. Yes, they'd be roughly 10 times. In fact, it's almost linear. 256, that just means it gets used a bunch. That's good. Why? Well, because it costs a lot of money each year. The more you use it each year, the less it costs, right? That's simple economics. Using it a lot, that's good. That lowers the cost. That's that utilization, the storage that's used. I'm totally, these slides are not copyrighted in any way. The images are uh, public domain, and I'm certainly welcome to contact me, and I'll give you the slides uh, for this, it's also being videoed and it'll be up on YouTube. YouTube.
Let's take the next step. So we're going to get 5% more renewables. We're going from 90 to 95%. It takes four times the amount of battery storage. You can see it graphically there in that second to the last column, what it looks like. Four times the amount of storage. And the utilization drops in half. We're not utilizing it very much. Uh, I think you can see where this is going. To get to 99%, we need six times as much storage as what we did for that last 5% that we got. That only gets us 4%. You can see what it looks like down here, and our utilization is shot. To get to 100%, and this is probably 99.5%, really, or 99.7%, you need yeah, you know, three times, four times what you need for the 99%. That only gets you 1%. We fell off a cliff here. That's what, what the technical term when this kind of thing happens, right? You all know the technical terms for this, right? Are you assuming that the solar and wind capacity is just enough to meet the load? Or are you considering putting overcapacity in there on the solar and wind side because it's much cheaper than solar? The question was, are we thinking of this as just a barely enough solar and wind to meet the load? Or are we doing, quote, overcapacity? The answer, the short answer is overcapacity. We're actually building more wind and solar than would traditionally be thought about that. I have a real problem with the term overcapacity when referring to renewables. And the reason is because when the, the electric U companies, like um, I showed you those pictures of all those coal-fired power plants and natural gas turbines that Platte River Power Authority had, that's way more generation than they need. But we didn't say it was overbuilding the generation. We said it's right-sizing because that's what you need for maximum reliability. In the case of renewables, when we build more than we might think we might otherwise need, it actually minimizes our cost. That's not overbuilding. That's right-sizing for cost. Did I answer your question? You should talk more later. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, why did we fall off this cliff? And it has to do with the data. So I've got another complex chart ahead. I'll take the time to explain this a little bit. I'm not going to explain it for the really numerate people, the people that want to know every single detail about what's going on here, partly because you really can't see it from the audience there. But everything is shown here. Every single hour of the year is shown. All 8,760 hours that are in the year are here. The red line, that's how much electricity we use. The green that's above the red line, that's um, excess surplus zucchinis, surplus renewables. If you look closely, you can see there are places where it's black above the line. That's the batteries charging. Below the line, you can see some areas of yellow. That's filling in with natural gas. This is 95% renewables. You'll probably agree with me that this drop with yellow there, that's the Grand Canyon of natural gas usage in the year. That's about a week where there was really very little renewables. Not much wind, not much solar. There were other times as well, but that was the worst. That Grand Canyon, that's what we're filling in with batteries. That's why we need so much batteries, is we're trying to fill that in with the battery storage. And we got pretty close, 99.7%, but not all the way. So here's another essential question. We have good renewable energy data for about 30 years or so. We actually have good weather data for about 100 years. Let's take that good weather data and make an estimate of whether the renewables were good or not, and let's find the worst canyon in 100 years. That's probably a smart thing to know. And what's the worst year in 100 years? Is it always more or less the same time, or does it move around? We should be able to answer those questions with 100-year data and be a lot more comfortable with 30 than 30-year data. Not that 30-year data is bad, it's great, but better to have 100-year data for this. Is the wind going to be blowing when there's a cold snap on the eastern plains where we have our wind generation? If we're going to electrify everything like heating all our buildings, we better know that to a reasonable degree, because otherwise we've got a problem. If we've got, you know, a whole four weeks 
of no wind, that's a problem in the winter, if that's the coldest for weeks. Is the sun likely to be shining in a, in a heat wave? That's another great question. We should be able to answer that. There may be studies that have done this. I just haven't found them. Okay, back over here. Now you know why that's so big, is we're filling in this great big Grand Canyon of, of usage where there's very little sun and wind. But what are we going to do for storage? Well, we really don't want to utilize something that costs a lot of money just 10 times in a year. We want to use it a lot. So maybe there's a sweet spot where storage like batteries or pumped hydro doesn't work. And we've got to do something different, altogether different. Maybe we just run natural gas. That's an option. Maybe there's something else that we could do, this kind of long-term storage. We've got to kind of think of it as short-term storage. That's the stuff above the sweet spot mark and above the sweet spot mark for the people on video. And, um, and below the sweet spot mark, that'd be long-term storage. Maybe we take some of that surplus zucchinis, the surplus electricity we have, and we make natural gas or liquid fuel. In fact, there are um, demonstration scale factories that are doing that in Germany right now, taking surplus electricity and making natural gas, and then they took, take and inject that natural gas into the existing natural gas pipeline and storage system. Maybe we take and use the existing natural gas turbines that Platte River Power Authority has and use those to burn that naturally made natural gas, no, that solar made, that wind made, that renewably made natural gas. Or maybe we use a liquid fuel. There's all kinds of questions we'd like to know about this. Um, does it make any sense? Is it cost effective? The round trip, we put electricity in and we get electricity out. We have to put in like 10 kilowatt hours of electricity in and get one kilowatt hour out is probably not cost effective. Do we think maybe batteries will get so cheap that we don't even need to do this? Could we pick something that's a liquid or a gas or a solid? Can we find something that's not a greenhouse gas itself? Methane's a potent greenhouse gas. We don't want to have methane around. We don't want to make it. It leaks. Can we find something else that's not a greenhouse gas that would still work? Maybe. How many people know what biochar is? A goodly number of you, real briefly for the rest of you, if you take wood, for example, or any other biomass, and, and do the right thing with it, you can drive off most of the hydrogen, and what's left is a matrix of carbon. That matrix of carbon, if you bury it in the soil, turns out it lasts a long time in the soil, maybe even hundreds of years. So you're sequestering carbon. And what's more is that it improves the fertility and the water holding of the soil. Is it a good idea? I don't know. Lots of people are experimenting with it. But this may be a way for us to fill in the Grand Canyon that we need to fill in, is by using biochar. Because the hydrogen that's driven off, we can use that to make electricity. Speak up. You could use the hydrogen for that. Yes, hydrogen's got some storage issues. We'd have to work that out. It's all cost. It all comes down to cost and practicality. Hydrogen's also hard to store. You, you can store a lot more energy in methane in a given tank than, or a given underground storage area than you can hydrogen. Who knows? It's just math, right? OK, I think we've answered the reliability question pretty well. Let's focus on cheap and 100%. How many people recognize this slide? Yeah, a number of you do. Excel Energy went off to get bids in 2017 for all comers. And what they got was an amazing pile of renewable energy. They're about 20, I don't know, 25% or something like that renewable today. And in 2023, they'll be 50%, 50, 55%, 55% renewables. Okay? The reason is because the price was so, so low. They said, oh my God. The price went down. Who knew that mass production would work? <laughs> they left 95% of the bids. These are separate projects that they left on the table. 95% of them. And that got them to 55%. That would seem to indicate that there might be some more renewables out there. These are not just somebody's good idea. These were bids. 
the people had the solar farm. They knew where the solar was going to go. They had the leases on the land for the wind. They knew where the transmission was. Oh, no, there'll, there'll be some issues associated with this. But this was a phenomenal response. Excel said in their next step, so they did the RFP and they got the results. You saw the results. And then they came back and they said this was unprecedented cost reduction. Unprecedented. These are some of the costs that they got, if you're really uh, to date on costs. We'll go to costs in a little bit more. And, uh, uh, and they said, wow, that's amazing. We're going to do this. And they convinced the Public Utilities Commission that it was cost effective to do. And they are. The contracts are signed, as far as I know. They're building them. They're in the, the, the design phase, the final design phase and, and issues on this. 55% um, renewables. <laughs> That's an amazing change in pretty short numbers of years. But I wanted to compare the prices in a way that people could understand. Because if I say 15 and 27 and yada, 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 nobody's going to understand it. Okay, Nobody's going to keep it. Even the numerate people have trouble keeping a pile of numbers. But most people can keep little bar charts in mind. New wind coming in at $15 a megawatt hour. That's the same thing as 1.5 cents a kilowatt hour. Remember I said that the blended cost for Platte Liver Power Authority was eight cents. Okay, about six, five or six cents of that is generation of the electricity. And here we have a source of electricity that's one and a half cents a kilowatt hour, or $15 a megawatt hour. $21 for new wind plus batteries. They didn't do any of those. Um, they did do solar, that came in at 25. And down here, I added in just the cost for natural gas. Now, it's a pretty big range. It goes from $22 to $43, almost doubling. And the difference is where you burn the natural gas, because what we're making is electricity. We're not, we don't care about the cost of the natural gas. This is based on $3.50 a million BTU for the people that are numerate. That's a very low price historically, but it's been about the price for the last six years. So before that, that was a very low price, but it's kind of stabilized at three and a half dollars a million BTU. Just the fuel, just the fuel, $22 in the less efficient gas turbines. Some gas turbines are inefficient. Some gas turbines are almost twice as efficient. These use less gas. They cost less money. I said that wrong. $22 is the most efficient gas turbines. Okay? I do this a lot and I get it wrong. No wonder other people get it wrong. 43, that's the least efficient gas turbines. Platte River Power Authority only has the less efficient gas turbines. So they will be driven to renewables faster. In fact, you can buy one megawatt hour this much electricity of wind plus one megawatt hour of solar and you're still less than the cost of just the purchase of the fuel. This is a very conservative number. Let's make it less conservative because the case gets better for doing lots of renewables. I didn't actually have these numbers up until about four days ago. This isn't perfect because no number's perfect. But it's a reasonable estimate. It probably overstates it a little bit for an electric utility, but not a lot. Because it doesn't, the numbers I have don't break down electric utility versus not. How's everybody doing? Everybody doing good? Good. Yeah, okay. Excellent. I added in the cost of the storage and distribution system. Because it's not just the cost of the fuel at the wellhead you got to get it to the power plants and you got to store it for the winter time when we use more. That changes the price so that we could actually buy, it looks like, four wind or maybe two wind and one solar. Yeah. But isn't the, that cost including transportation, whereas the wind and solar cost would include the cost of the wires or the distribution? So they're not quite up to that. It's not perfect. Yeah. Transmission costs are probably lower for electric system, although but not zero. <laughs> but it's not zero. That's correct. Um, yeah. Yep. 
we have some very detail-oriented people here, which is great. I love it. Thank you. Keep me honest. So the question was, I'll repeat the question for the, uh, uh, for the TV audience, uh, is uh, aren't there costs for moving the electricity around? The answer is yes and no. In the case of Platte River Power Authority, their grid is way overbuilt. Their transmission grid is way overbuilt. Um, really, most transmission grids are way overbuilt. And in fact, they can probably run an awful lot of renewables. At some point, I asked one of their transmission people, um, could you run twice as much through your system? And they said, no problem. So that's already a sunk cost. So there's no additional cost for transmission for them on their wires, maybe on somebody else's wires. OK, let's fill in some more and let's move ahead. Uh, uh, the existing federal hydro, I love this little number. <laughs> I had always assumed that you know, existing federal hydro was so cheap that you didn't have to meter it. And it turns out it's not. Flat River Power Authority gets federal hydro. They were willing to tell us their prices. They'll tell anybody uh, just about anything. They're a marvelous company. Um, $27. It's actually more expensive than new solar for federal hydro. Yeah, wow, that's what I said. And new wind is uh, half the price. Uh, somebody asked about right-sizing wind. You could buy two winds and still be cheaper than the federal solar. Or right in the same ballpark. And let's fill in existing coal. We know that coal used to be the cheapest electricity cost. I'll get there in a second. Um, coal is the, used to be the cheapest electricity cost. There's a range of costs. Platver Power Authority's Rawhide Power Plant is almost certainly the cheapest coal-fired electricity in the state. It's actually probably one of the cheapest coal-fired power plants in the country. It's because they're close to the coal mines, to the cheapest coal, which is Powder River Basin, coal from Wyoming, and they are obsessed with making their plant just as efficient and clean as possible. They're also one of the cleanest coal-fired power plants in the country, probably. Obsessed. Excel, oh, well, they're for-profit, you know, it's a little different company. And so they have a higher cost associated with it, and that's kind of the range. I don't know some of the other power plants. I, I would suspect some of the uh, um, Colorado Springs Muni power plants to be fairly expensive on this. And natural gas, this is the all-in cost of natural gas. You've got just the fuel here. This is everything included, capital, operations, maintenance, and fuel. Two studies came out. I don't know if anybody saw these, so I'll mention them, and if I have, raise your hand. So the first one came out in January, and it looked at closing all the coal-fired power plants in Colorado very soon and replacing it with wind and, and solar, a mix of wind and solar and small amount of storage, and that it would save all of us $2.5 billion over something like 10 years. Anybody see that report? Yeah, some of you did. Okay. Renewables are cheaper. That's what that means. Anybody heard of Guzman Energy? Yeah, okay, this was in the paper. Um, Guzman offered to buy one of the existing running coal-fired power plants outright, retire the debt for the people that had debt on the coal-fired power plant, replace it with wind and solar, and by the way, provide a bunch of jobs. That was the stated offer in the newspaper. We don't know what was actually offered or what the details of this are, but the reason is because First, they're a very aggressive company, and they've figured out that renewables are cheaper. And remember a long time ago, I said that there was, there was money on the table going from $5 billion of electricity to $9 billion of electricity in cost? They understand that there's $4 billion of electricity generation at play, and they want part of that action, I think. I can't prove that. Great study. If you look up G-U-Z-M-A-N, you'll find them or send an email to me. Okay, you remember this chart from, from 27 years ago. By the way, we're way more than halfway done. Uh, you had a question, Evan. What accounts for the, the unexpectedly high cost of hydro? Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that's what it costs. For, there's operations and maintenance on, on, the, on the dams, and there may be, in fact, still some payback. Uh, in terms of, of that. It's not just free to let the water out. There's people's salaries to pay. There's maintenance that has to be done. I'm sure there's some reserve funds and transmission lines aren't free. I'd be surprised if a lot of 
that was maintenance because at dams I've seen, there's like a handful of employees on a gigantic dam making many megawatts. So we must have gone into debt to build these giant things. Possibly. Um, the way I got this number was from Platte River Power Authority. They actually list all the costs of their generation. In the case of, uh, and they actually break it down by which uh, hydro generator they, they take it from. And we did a, a balancing of the costs that it suggested, a weighted average of the cost. Um, it's probably as good a number as you're going to get. Um, it may be that there's some transmission costs involved in this. And um, Glen Canyon Dam is where most of the electricity comes from, and it's a long ways away. Next. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's like, uh, it could also be added liability cost from a dam. If, you know, if there's a dam failure, that it could be paying insurance, I mean, some of the cost. But also, you get silt built up underneath the dam, you know, from all the, the sediment that gets stuck by the dam that makes them less efficient over time. Uh -huh. Most of the federal dams are 100 years old, so they have a lot of, they're all less efficient now than when they built them. Okay, so the questions had to do with why was the hydro so expensive? Uh, $27, and uh, the other question was uh, in part an answer to that, uh, which was, it was not a question, it was a comment, which was um, uh, that uh, there are, tell me again? This point, liability cost. Right, liability cost, and then the dams are silting up. They're slowly filling up with silt that is moving into them, and that there may be costs associated with that. These seem reasonable. Hydro is cheap compared to existing coal and natural gas. That's right. It's only when wind and solar plummeted that all of a sudden we're like $27 is expensive. It, that used to be a, a fabulous number, but you know, yeah. mass production has worked and here we are. So the comment was that, if you couldn't hear, the comment was that uh, um, natural gas is cheap in comparison to the coal and natural gas generation. The hydro is cheap in comparison to the coal and natural gas. Okay, back to zucchinis. This is the entire year shown here. You know, zucchinis, we've got to have zucchinis. This is too hard to see where the surplus is. This is way complicated. So what I did is I took just the surplus. And I said, let's plot it just like we did with the zucchinis. There it is. That's the surplus. OK, so it kind of runs winter, spring, um, into summer. You have less surplus in the summertime into the fall and then into winter again. Where it's really dense, where the lines are really close together, it's probably pretty easy to sell that surplus to somebody because the lines are pretty close together. But in that kind of middle-ish to the right section where they aren't close together, it's hard to find somebody that wants to buy those because some of those are seven or eight days apart when you're going to have some of that surplus. And if you're going to make an investment of some kind, you want that investment to pay off as much as possible. So one of the things that we could do, remember we have all those nice natural gas generators sitting there. We could put in the yellow spikes there, fill in some of those holes with natural gas, and make it so it's less time. And we'll just absorb that extra cost into our overall view of what it is that, that we have, our overall picture. It's pretty minimal because we don't have to run them very much to generate that kind of surplus. And that makes it easier to sell. So we'll keep that surplus in there as we move forward. Here are the ways that we can use up that surplus. The first thing we can do is turn it off. That's called curtailment. Because if you're in the electric utility business, you have to do something that's not just turning it off. Curtailment's the fancy word. That's the right word to use it. You can turn them off. It doesn't hurt the solar panels. They get a little hotter. It doesn't really hurt the wind turbines much. It's not ideal for them, but they can be back down on this. We don't want to do that because it increases our cost. Well, why? Well, most of these are done as contracts, or somebody had to pay for them. And if they're not generating electricity, they're not being paid for the electricity that they would have generated. The owners of those contracts probably aren't going to be too happy. They're going to want to be paid, even if you told them to turn it off. In fact, that's the case. Oh, they might let you turn it off 1% of the time. But remember I said we might have 40% surplus? They're not going to let you turn it off for that number of hours. That's not so bad, though, because electricity price is so low. In fact, you can do the math. In fact, our model will let you do the math and say, what if you get nothing? You just turn them off, those hours that are curtailed otherwise. It turns out it's not very much because the cost of the renewables is so low. 
Maybe it goes up a half a cent a kilowatt hour or a penny a kilowatt hour, something like that. You want to download the model? You can. It's free. Send me an email. Happy to do it. It's been downloaded more than a hundred times, by the way, in multiple countries. And it's also, the model has been used actually to challenge electric utilities at certain states' public utilities commissions. Interesting. For a model that's written in Microsoft Excel that you can download for free. Oh, oh Excel's model is called Strategist right now. To put it in perspective, it's $100,000 a year per seat for the cost of their model. Three hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, you know. Oh, okay. It does a lot more things than this does. The biggest thing it does is it solves for profit, because Excel is a monopoly for-profit corporation, and they care about profit. Oh, oh, they want to keep the lights on too. That's essential. Okay, and they want to do it at low cost, but they want to maximize their profit, and that's what Strategist does. It, it does things like transmission flows and distribution planning, all kinds of good stuff. Okay. Here's the real problem. Solar tax credit is up front. It's called an investment tax credit. You make the investment, you get the money. You get the tax credit. There's a production tax credit for wind. It's over 10 years. You take and you get it as you produce the electricity. If you don't produce the electricity, you don't get the tax credit. The tax credit is more than the cost of the electricity. Okay? They get one and a half cents a kilowatt hour for the electricity. They get 2.2 cents for the tax credit. That's not such a good choice. I don't think that's a good choice. We don't want to do it. We don't want our prices to be up. We want our prices to be as low as possible. We could sell it to other utilities. Let's look at that. This 95% scenario has 2,000 megawatt hours of storage. To put that in perspective, there are two big pumped hydro units in, uh, in Colorado. Everybody knows what pumped hydro is? Okay. Um, well, very briefly, you have two dams, one's above the other. You pump up when you have excess electricity, you let it go and generate electricity when you need it. Okay, that's pumped hydro. This storage for 6% of the services of the state, 6% of the state being served, is 2,000 megawatt hours. That's half of the pumped hydro for the entire state for one little utility. They don't think they're little. They're big. Okay. It works out to three hours of peak generation. There's a couple hours a year where Platte River Power Authority generates the maximum amount that they need to to meet their load. This is three hours of peak generation for them. The wind isn't that different in northern Colorado as it is in the middle of Colorado. The sun isn't that different. Okay, it's not that many hours off. How many hours is it off? I don't know. We don't have that data. Somebody does. I'd like to have that done. And one of, if I get a volunteer, that, that question will get answered. We'll be able to answer it ourselves. Even if we don't have all the data, we have enough of the data. Um, it would seem like if you have three hours of peak, that would be like five hours of sort of average. Uh, you can shift your renewables as much as anybody else can. You're not going to be able to sell it to anybody. And in fact, we see this already. We have markets, electricity markets, where electricity is actually traded on an hour ahead and sometimes a 15-minute ahead basis. And even at just 20%, that's Texas, and 30%, that's California, we actually see times where the price of electricity goes negative. That is not the sign of a functioning market. That's a sign of a problem. You can't maintain that. You're paying somebody to use your electricity. You probably have a problem with that. I don't think this is going to work at high levels of renewables. It's not that we don't want to do it because there's this transition period. When we're going from 50 to 80 percent renewables, we probably want to be able to sell to other utilities. Okay, we'll want to be able to do this trading. And there'll be a few hours a year where we want to be able to do this trading. Do we want to spend a hundred million dollars to develop a market so that we can do this? Uh-uh. I don't think so. The good news is that there are ways so that we can actually join a market without paying very much. It's called the voluntary energy imbalance market. Voluntary. Doesn't cost very much to join. That would seem like a good place to go. 
This is the one I like, is to offer it as a discount to existing, flexible use customers. Why shouldn't we offer really cheap electricity? We paid for the system, or a lot of the system, at our basic cost for electricity, the surplus. We should be able to sell that for cheap. How many people drove something here? Okay, yeah, most of us. Um, how many of you paid about $2.30 a gallon or $1 a gallon equivalent or less than that? How many people paid about $2.30? Yeah, most of us. How many paid about a buck? Yeah, the people that, how many people drove electric? Okay, you paid about a buck, a gallon equivalent, okay? We have a lot of electric vehicles in here. Um, if you haven't test driven an electric vehicle, you should, and uh, because it's the future. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but that's okay. And, uh, and you should talk to one of the people that are uh, electric vehicle enthusiasts. We have a leaf. We love it. Yeah, I and mean, people are waving their hands and smiling. You can't see that. Um, so uh, this is my mom plugging in an electric vehicle at a buck a gallon. That's the typical residential rate for the average for the country. Uh, but really what we should be doing is making it so that you can charge up when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. Uh, how many people think that there are EV chargers today that can do that? Yeah, you should be raising your hand. Everybody raise your hand here because the answer is yes, they exist today. Uh, in fact, that's my electric vehicle charger. It does it today. Oh, oh it doesn't do it for Colorado. So if you're being really literal, then, then you were right. Okay, but it does it today. Uh, here's the app. I could show you the app on my phone. We're beautiful on time, by the way. The questions are happening, and we'll be done, well, we'll probably be done about 8.25. Uh, you can see California's real-time market back in the background there, and the blue line, that's the green, the blue sort of in the middle of that app screen is, uh, um, is the day-ahead market. And it uses a little bit of intelligence to make sure that I'm charged. I say I want to be 100% charged by 7 in the morning, for example. And it makes sure that I am. Uh, this is PG&E in California, the PG&E Peninsula. Um, and if I live there, well, I'd get rewards because I'm actually charging based on this. But I don't live there, so I don't get the rewards. No utility in Colorado yet does this, but they could today, okay? They should today. I'm moralizing here, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, I'd like a little change, please, to the, all the people that are designing these out there, because you just never know when you're gonna have a, a charger designer in the audience. I want it to charge to 50%, because our next electric vehicle is gonna have way more range than we typically use. I want to charge to 50% every single night by 7 a.m. And I want to charge 100% when it's really cheap. Right? That makes sense. Everybody's nodding their heads. Just about everybody's nodding their heads. This makes sense. This is what we want. We want to use up the surplus zucchinis. This is the way to do that. And you can implement it now. It uses my Wi-Fi. I don't need any smart meters. It's all done through the app, through the, uh, through the charger. Platte River Power Authority, our heroes, are offering a $200 rebate. I'm sorry, how many people are in Platte River Power Authority's territory? Nobody here, okay. <laughs> I didn't get it either. I'm not in Platte River Power Authority's territory. Um, so uh, I didn't get it. It's actually, there's more, there's a $150 rebate on top of that. Uh, for this particular charger, the deal is they get your data and we hope that they'll introduce this smart charging so that they use up their surplus zucchinis when the price is cheap. How many people know somebody that lives in Fort Collins, Longmont, Loveland, or Estes Park? A lot of you. Contact them today, okay, before you forget. Seriously, this is actually, if you want to pick something that's easy to do, that makes a difference, call them up and say, if you got an electric vehicle, do you got an electric vehicle? They might have it and you might not know, okay? If they got one, get one of these chargers. Start using it now. Pay the money. They pay the money for electric vehicles. They're dedicated to the cause. This is crucially important that we get it moving as quickly as possible. Okay? This is worth somebody installing. 
Oh, oh, I don't know if that's worth somebody installing. I'm asking for, might be 500 bucks to install after the rebate, might be 1,000 depending on how hard it is to wire up wherever you're putting your charger. But tell them about this and tell them to get on the, on the list to, to do this for this and then to start very politely asking Platte River Power Authority to provide rewards so that encourages charging when there's there. They have the data already. It's all it is is connecting the data to the juice net, juice box, juice net, you all get it, okay? Connecting it in and people turning it on in their charger. That's it. So uh, this is offering a discount. How many people are surprised that I estimated how much diesel and gasoline was sold in Platte River Power Authority's territory? Nobody, really? <laughs> okay. Well, it turns out it's about 40% extra. Oh, well, it's the same number we had before because it turns out that's linear. We have 35% surplus in this scenario. That's pretty close. We can use up not every bit of the surplus, but a lot of the surplus to charge our electric vehicles if we're smart about it. Let's do that. Okay, just so you know, Texas is a competitive electric market. They have something called nights and weekends free electricity. You all know this because you used to have, a lot of you, most of you know this. There might be one or two people that are young enough to not know this. But most of this had cell phone plans where it wasn't free for the minutes, okay? And where you actually could use, get extra minutes by using them at a certain point in time because the network was used less at that time. Well, that's true for electricity too. The wind blows really well most of the time in Texas at night. Um, weekends, there's less electricity used. That's why this works. Okay, as we have more and more, we got to be able to get people to use the electricity. Here's another idea, is to take, and not for individual customers, but maybe for big customers, not for residential, but for big customers. How many people know what a reverse auction is? Okay, reverse auction runs a different way. If I did a reverse request for proposals, Instead of the lowest bid that's acceptable wins, the highest bid wins. Let's bid out the surplus. Here are the rules. You get 10 megawatts of capacity. We guarantee you're going to get 2,000 hours a year. And we're not going to tell you when. You've got to take it when we tell you. You've got to take it when we tell you. Okay? And we guarantee you'll get at least 2,000 hours. Now tell us the maximum price you're willing to bid in order to do that, let's have innovation from the open market helping us solve this problem. A reverse RFP for the surplus, to buy the surplus, customers buying the surplus. When's Excel going to implement this? Yeah? So if you're a buyer, if you're someone who, uh, you somebody that wants to buy that energy, but you don't know, you have to take it where they want to give it to you. Yeah. It seems like to me that wouldn't be of much value unless you could store, use it, you could store it somehow. I'm not going to tell you the solution because that's what I want the market to do, but I'll give you an example of something that might work. We fix nitrogen from the air to make ammonia and fertilizer. We use natural gas to do that, okay? We could use electricity to do that. How about it fixes, it's a basically automated factory or it needs one or two attendants, and it fixes nitrogen when the electricity is really, really cheap. That would be an example of how you could do that. Would it work? Nobody's done it yet, but there isn't any question that you can fix nitrogen with electricity, so let's find out. You know, I think we've demonstrated we can probably be cheaper than what we're doing right now, in fact, a lot cheaper. So I got a few short items. I'm just going to rattle through these. This is actually a picture of Colorado's natural gas distribution and storage system. Suppose we actually were able to reduce the amount of usage of natural gas by, say, 30% or 50%. What happens to the cost? The cost of this system per unit goes up because we're using a lot less units. Is it significant? I don't know, Ooh. although I'm getting some inklings on that. Um, I didn't know the answer to that. So here's the question. As we use less and less, what happens? I'd like some historians that know history of businesses to try and answer this question for us. 
These aren't just any old utilities. They're electric and gas utilities. They're regulated. We promised them a profit on their investments. We have to do something about that. We can't just let them go totally belly up and close the system until we're ready because it's going to be a long time before all the houses are converted from natural gas to electricity. We may have to help them do that because that might be the cheapest possible thing. What about with coal transport costs? There's a train line in western Colorado where it used to be, the coal mine used to service three coal-fired power plants and now it's servicing one. And the coal train transport is about to go bankrupt. Oh, what an interesting problem. We shouldn't be sitting there going, what an interesting problem and surprised. We should be prepared for that. We can look at this and say, this is going to happen to us. And as the world continues to turn, three days ago, I read a study that just came out, was presented to California by Energy Environmental Economics with support from NRDC. The green curve, that's what happens to the cost of people that are all electric between now and 2050. And the yellow curve, that's for people that are electric mixed with gas. We do not want to be on the yellow curve because that's two and a half times your combined electric and gas utility piece cost. Two and a half times. How many people think that would be a real problem if we started charging poor people two and a half times what we charge now for electricity and gas? Not acceptable. Is this study right? It's a study. They did a lot of work to make this as right as they could but we need other studies that look at this. But this is a great starting point, and it was certainly kind of a gift in my inbox uh, when it came out. Yeah, Evan. How come with the decreasing cost of wind and solar, the green line isn't going down a lot more? Because there are other costs that are associated with transitioning that they've factored in. Are they right? I don't know. At least it's flat and not absurd. <laughs> Okay, uh, you remember this chart. Um, I crossed out the four and a half billion dollar savings per year because if costs go up for gas, the savings gets to be much higher. That's a future savings. We won't realize that as an actual savings, but it could cost us a lot more for gas than it does. Here's the last question that I have. Oh, oh I have other questions too, but this is the last key question. Uh, we need the data. Excel says their information is highly confidential. Their hourly data, their cost data, their load data is highly confidential. In New Mexico, you can get the data off the web. Is that because New Mexico has different laws about it? Yep, every state has different laws. I need somebody to research this question and find out what other states have this data publicly available or easy to get because we want to make the case to the Public Utilities Commission that <laughs> highly confidential because honestly, we'll be comparing data to Excel's data. We want to be able to challenge them toe to toe, nose to nose, and eye to eye without blinking. And to do that, we need their data. They're a monopoly. They do not have competition except at the Public Utilities Commission. Executive privilege. <laughs> How can we assure the people of Colorado that they're getting cost-effective solutions? How can we assure that innovation is brought to fore? I don't know. You remember this chart? These are quick topics. This is a new topic, okay? You remember this chart? We left 95% on the bid. I had a friend who was not numerate, but pretty smart, say, Ken, I know you got all these bids. I don't know what they mean. I don't understand the graphs but I want to know is there enough renewables for all of Colorado? And I said, because I didn't know the answer to that question, and I said, I don't know, but I'll get back to you. So I sat down with the model for about an hour and I answered the question. Here's the answer. Using only these two parts, we're still leaving a lot of the bids on the table, okay? All of the wind and all of the solar with battery storage. This isn't optimized at all. I just went bulk because I just wanted to answer the question quickly. We could do 95% renewables with 60% surplus. This would certainly in seem to indicate that there's enough renewables out there. 
Two and a half years ago, I came here and spoke. We had 100 people in the audience. It was the Trump bump. Trump had just been elected. People were in shock. <laughs> Some of us are still in shock. Uh, Crest may need to cut that <laughs> off the video. I'm sorry. Um, okay, and I stood up here and I said, don't believe everything you think. And I said, I think that competition might be a good idea and this idea needs to be researched. And I've had uh, the great good fortune to have a number of people, really smart people helping out and getting involved in this. Larry, could you stand up for a second? Larry, Larry Milosevic. Let's give this man a round of applause. Not only has he done a bunch of research, he went and he's gotten involved in dockets at the Public Utilities Commission. He submitted testimony to the Public Utilities Commission. He has submitted testimony at the Capitol. Some of the testimony that he and another fellow named Dan Greenberg, if you know Dan, thank him for this. This is a volunteer. Uh, some of my volunteers are way above and beyond the pale, and Larry is definitely one of them. Dan's another. Uh, I believe that they had significant influence, along with Vince and other people, of course, on the legislation that was passed to make it much better legislation than it was when it originally went in. So um, we got this Energy Freedom Colorado.org. It didn't exist back in 2017, early 2017. Uh, we were working to bring this to Colorado. There's a whole bunch of white papers on our website. We're in the midst of changing it. There's something called Community Choice Aggregation. There's a video for this, and I forgot to put the link in it, but if you Google uh, Cress Sean Marshall or email me, and I can get you the link to her video uh, for this. Um, and by the way, we got community choice as one of the key bullet items that t t there's now, it turns out, two interim committees, one for the House and one for the Senate, investigating investor-owned utilities this is off the session. Our session's four months long. The rest of the time, uh, the legislature sometime, legislators sometimes meet. And so they're doing this, and they're actually going to be looking at the role of community aggregated choice in the consumer price of energy. Nobody in Colorado was talking about consumer choice or customer choice aggregation before we were in any significant way. Let's review. Modeling is good. We can do 100%, or no, darn close, and this is the recipe, and it's a magnificent savings. Four and a half billion dollars, somebody said, oh, we'll have to do transmission in investments. Yeah, we'll have to do transmission investments. Four and a half billion dollar savings, we can pay for a lot of transmission. Transmission's really expensive, but it ain't no four and a half billion dollars to do what needs to be done. If we're smart, we'll do non-wires alternatives. We'll find things that are cheaper than transmission lines. You've seen this. We know that you don't, bigger is not better. Um, we know that we can move forward with reliability, even at 95% renewables. We know that part of the problem is cost, part of the problem is reliability. We know what happens as storage moves up in the world. Um, we have a sweet spot with long-term storage. Um, we, maybe there's something we do differently with long-term storage, like making natural gas with the surplus electricity. We know the cost of renewables are really, really low. We know that we can do some things that are magic right now if the utilities were providing the information in Colorado. In Colorado, we know that we're going to contact Platte River Power Authority and talk it up to the people we know there and get them to sign up for this program or at least investigate it. We know that the conversion to electric vehicles is close to the surplus cost and we have some fancy ways to do things and we have a bunch of questions. Uh, we can do this, and I'll take questions. Uh, usually there's a round of applause. <laughs> you were so stunned. No, go ahead. What's the question? You. Um, so I'm not a professional, but I've read a few articles on atmospheric uh, carbon sequestration, which yes. is basically just taking carbon from the air that's around us. And I know there's a couple of issues. One is the carbon footprint of doing it is sometimes worse than what you get back. So they're working on that. And also the cost is expensive. So I was kind of thinking, uh, oh, and then I got, I, I was kind of thinking when you were talking about the excess power that we just throw away, 
that perhaps we could use it for that purpose. Now, I kind of thought in my head, well, is the, is the carbon footprint in making devices or actually using them? And I think it's using them because I did read this one article that said that um, we might be able to actually use air conditioners and stuff because they're already blowing air and just put the devices on there. Uh -huh. So if that's a possibility, that would be kind of cool because here's this electricity that we don't need anyway, right? and we're trying to figure out what to do with it, and we can maybe scrub the air a little bit. So the question is about atmospheric sequestration of carbon. In fact, that's what biochar does because the plant grows and it sequesters the carbon for us and we don't have to spend a lot of energy to do the actual moving of air, which is the big problem because even though 450 parts per million sounds like a scary number or 350 or 370 or whatever we're up to now is a scary number, it's actually a very minute part of the air is actually carbon dioxide. That means to get, extract a molecule of carbon, that molecule right there, out of the air, we have to move an awful lot of air in order to get those molecules there in any kind of number. So you have to moving air, that takes a lot of energy. And yet, we could use a surplus for that. I don't care what we use the surplus for as long as we use it for something useful. And I wanted to say one more thing, is that if anyone, because I'm willing to, I was willing to do this even before I came here. If anyone wants to test drive, uh, I've got a Tesla Model 3, got autopilot, got zero to 60. Five seconds, just come talk to me. <laughs> right, thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned that there's about a $900 savings per person per year to, if you get rid of all the you know, in house heating and your. Electrify electric. everything. Yeah. Did you, have you seen any studies indicating what sort of the upfront cost is? Because a lot of those things are you pay for them now and you get the benefit you know, over the next yep. 10 years. And, but something we're not good at as humans is paying for things now. Right. So there is an upfront cost associated with this. Let's see, with electric vehicles, oh, actually, I think at this point, if the rebates, uh, the federal, if you can get the federal rebate and the uh, state rebate, so uh, $7,500 plus $5,000 state tax credit, credit, not deduction, uh, it's actually bucks in your pocket. Um, I don't, the, maybe the Tesla is more expensive, maybe it's not than a comparable car. So let's see, the upfront cost on the electric vehicle is um, maybe it's negative. You actually get money back. Um, yeah, making our houses and buildings so that they are electrified, that will cost a bunch of money. The answer is there are some studies that have looked at various aspects of this. Um, it just depends. We hope that the cost will come down for electrifying buildings. Uh, if you looked at that chart, you remember the natural gas was this for heating and comfort was the smallest part of all of that. And there's not much savings associated with it. If it's the smallest part, if economics works the way we sometimes think it does, we'll do that last. But maybe we'll get pushed because if we actually reduce the amount of natural gas we're using for other things, the cost of natural gas for the rest of the, not the gas itself, but the transport and, and storage will go up, maybe. Uh, Larry in the back. I haven't heard the word conservation in your lecture yet, and I'm, I think it deserves uh, a few yep. thousand So let years. me answer that. Okay, so the answer is conservation is awesome if it's cost effective. Okay, when electricity costs, when we were comparing electricity conservation costs to 10 cents a kilowatt hour, it was a lot easier to do conservation than it is when we're comparing it to one and a half cent for, elect for wind and two cents for solar. I love conservation, it's awesome. Okay. I've done a lot of conservation in our home. I recommend you do it where it's cost effective. But where is it cost effective? We don't fully understand that yet. You don't really get to compare to one and a half cent electricity. There's all these other costs besides just the wind that we get to pay for. So we're really paying 10 cents or 12 cents electricity, kilowatt hour for electricity. That's what we're comparing to. Where you can do conservation, absolutely do conservation. Yes, conservation is good. Other questions? Yeah. I want to get back to my earlier question, but I need to see that chart again where you showed more and more storage as you get to higher and higher renewable penetration. I'm mean, going to have to go a ways back because. No, because it's the wrong one. Yeah, I know, it's, it's, but it's the wrong one. It doesn't show it right. I had a bad slide at the very end. It's in the review, and I can't go too fast because it overwhelms the computer. So I apologize. It's coming up soon, I promise. There it is. Okay. okay. So 
what you're saying here. I mean, it seems somewhat counterintuitive. Maybe I'm just misunderstanding something, but you're showing that the more and more renewables you have, the more and more storage is required. Yep. And why do you say that? Are you not assigning um, firm capacity to renewables? Is that why you're saying I'm not talking about capacity at all. In that, in that sense, what I'm talking about is that we have a Grand Canyon where we're filling in with natural gas. If we're at 100%, we're filling that in with renewables, so right? In a very extreme case where you don't have any wind and solar resource. In fact, that happens every year. And you don't fill it with battery storage necessarily. But anyway. Well, you've got to fill it with something. And so you're saying that, you know, but, but then the way you are not assigning current capacity to wind and solar, can you say that? All I did was look at the actual generation for a year, and I said, do we have enough? And the answer is, here's this big canyon that we've got to fill up. And the problem is, we don't know, was that particular year an extra big Grand Canyon, or was that particular year, it turns out, was actually a pretty small Grand Canyon. We don't know that. And you had the load data to, to yep. you match it on the We're matching to load. To, to to the uh, Platte River. To the Platte River Power Authority. Yep, we can follow up individually. Thank you so much.